Um, so welcome to uh, the, what we're calling the boom sessions. This is sort of like a sub-session within IPFS Connect um, that is focused on like in-flight exciting things that folks are working on. And by folks, I mean developers, you know, creators, builders, um, even users that are doing interesting things in the IPFS space um, that is maybe like not finished yet, or it's still a new idea, or uh, they just want to share their philosophy on how you do things in the IPFS ecosystem. Um, so Boom is, is, a, is a place for that. And you can see the sort of like very generic uh, uh, white slides that we have here, because the idea is you're not necessarily representing your company or your organization, or even yourself. You're just representing your ideas. And so um, we'll try and keep it really informal. We'll try and keep it really quick. We'll try and keep it really fun. Um, and uh, we'll try and keep it somewhat on time. So we got 90 minutes and a bunch of people who want to talk between 5 and 10 minutes. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, speaker, who is Jim from my team, uh, which is me cheating a little bit. but. Uh, I'll get him up here so that you can see kind of the, the format that we're looking for, the, the timing and all that stuff. Jim, you're going to see a countdown in front of you. Yep. Um, you got a maximum of 10 minutes, and I'm going to rudely stand up and cut you off at 10 minutes. Okay. So we're going to keep it on time, all right? So I just talk too fast. So you got to talk fast. Here we go. Okay, I guess I'm going. So <laughs> I'm here to talk about design, which I know I'm probably one of the only people, if not the only person, talking about design at IPFS Connect, if not the whole thing, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but yeah, but, uh, but about why you as developers and builders uh, should care about this sort of thing. Um, and yeah, as uh, Carson mentioned, I work at Textile and we're making Tableland. Um, I'm working on this thing called uh, Tableland Studio primarily, which is the UI to build distributed databases and manage them and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, they, uh, so I have a history. So I come from a family of developers, so I like to think that I understand how many of you think and like to work, but I ended up in art school. Two, I have two design degrees somehow. Um, but I'm interested in data and how people use it and how it affects our lives, and that kind of brought me into the IPFS community, among other things. Um, and yeah, what do we mean when we say design? This can mean loads of things. People think it means interior design, people think it means graphic design, and it's sort of all of that, really. Um, this in, in this kind of context, we're talking about the design of uh, user experience for software, I guess, and applications, that sort of thing. Two big ones, user-centered design is, well, you have a user, you should probably make something they want to use. That's the gist of it. And then design thinking is a more popular term lately, which basically means that you kind of just have loops of working and testing and prototyping and that sort of thing. Um, and kind of what it boils down to is just a creative solution to a problem. And I guess what, what does creative mean? It can mean, you know, people think that it comes from space, that artists and designers get this, you know, they have this sort of, well, um, intuition, really. Um, and that's not necessarily the case because everybody has intuition, you know? And when you're coming up with creative solutions to problems, um, you should have some sort of evidence with that. So you should have some, that you have facts, things that you can kind of point to. Um, and then finally, you should have experience, meaning learning. You've, you've figured things out over time. Things have been tested. And so that's all fine and dandy, right? To have these kind of high-floating ideas about, wow, we're going to be really creative with solutions to dev tools and that. But how do we, how, what's some way we can think about that? And this is probably one of the better ones, right? And this could be similar to many development cycles. And it's a way to just kind of break things up. And, and I guess the, the front end of that, empathizing, defining an idea. And well, actually all of it's super important basically, but this is just one way to think about it really. Um, and another way to think about it is this thing called the double diamond. Uh, and this came out, uh, the UK Design Council came up with this. And this is just another really framework to, to kind of how can we come up with ideas? How can we kind of figure out what they actually, what the problems really are, which is the main gist of all this. How can we talk to real actual people and users? And kind of how we can we come up with some solutions and then validate those solutions. And that's kind of how, what it all boils down to. Now, and this is kind of uh, how this applies to the dev tools, really. And it's because that it's particularly suited for these ill-defined or unknown problems. And that's because um, the design is often missing this far up the stack. And the problem with that is, is that all of you are building tools for other people building tools, <laughs> generally, right? That there's these, like, 
kind of cascading levels of tool building. And the further down or up, I guess you could say, that you go in that stack, you, you know less and less of what's actually being done. And that's extremely problematic. So you have to begin to think about kind of these knock-on effects. And hopefully, um, design thinking and this idea of ideating and refining and whatnot is some way to help frame this. Um, and yeah, you have to think about what people are building. And the other thing that I've, um, so again, I, like I said, I, my dad was a programmer in the 60s, <laughs> um, and my sister, my brother, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, there's this thing, and all of my friends are programmers, but it's, it's this idea that the, the programmer, although you are a developer, the way that somebody else is developing is not necessarily the same. In fact, it's probably different. Um, so yeah, here's some ways to potentially think about this sort of thing. So um, kind of at a cursory level, it's um, yeah, shifting problem spaces because you're making tools. So you don't know how people are going to use those necessarily. You can kind of have some vague idea, but um, you have to think about your, not just your users who are also building tools, but your users' users. So where is that chain of events? What's going to happen at the end of that? Because ultimately, when you build tools, you're responsible in some way, shape, or form for how, how they're used. And that means that you kind of have to think of design processes and design frameworks pretty loosely. And a lot of designers are actually quite uncomfortable with that because they like to, to kind of lean into that intuition side of things and then just kind of say, well, I'm just going to follow this and that. And it doesn't really work that way. You know, you make stuff, it breaks, you try again, and then you give it to somebody and they use it somehow completely different, right? So, um, and again, the, the problem space could be very wide. And, and again, developers are people too, right? <laughs> um, they're not just the end users, but they are users and they have their own ways of doing things, their own idiosyncrasies, their own problems, their own, you know, everything really. So, and this is really important for looking at how you design dev tools is ranges of use, you know, people's real lives really. Um, and yeah, re re just research and iterate nonstop. And that's kind of why that first slide that it just like rinse and repeat, right? I did to prototype and then do it over again and keep on doing it over again, you know? And because the other thing is like when you're building tools, you got you just got to keep on building, right? You just always be building that sort of thing. And just but you have to test with real humans in the end of the day, and we need to kind of move away from what I perceive to be this bias towards um, just releasing and then seeing what happens. I think we need to be more nuanced with things like actually talking to people about how they're really working, um, and kind of moving away from assumptions towards evidence. Um, and I think this is the big thing, is, is thinking about playing fields, right? So again, you don't know what the tools people are building on top of your tools. Uh, you don't know how any of this is going to play out in the end of the day. So we have to think about kind of playing fields. Where are the borders? Where are the edges? How can we design those edges? How can we provide um, rules for how, how our things should work? Because again, um, we, the people building tools on top of our tools should be as better as good or better than ours, you know? So it all kind of, reputations move up and down, as we know. And, you know, thinking about this ranges of possibilities and how we can kind of do that with, you know, whether it be how the application works, how you install it, it could be one of a million things, right? And, um, yeah, so a quick example of this is I uh, did some work with uh, Dietrich Ayala at uh, Protocol Labs on the IPFS mobile design guidelines. So this is just an example of, of, of this idea of designing a playing field, right? Best practices. We don't really know how mobile phone devices, uh, sorry, mobile phone applications using IPFS will work in the end of the day because we can't really dictate it that much, but we can provide best practices, right? So, um, so yeah, you go through, let's say, this is just an example of how you could do it. You know, you'd have workshops, you'd kind of gather all that knowledge, you would examine the landscape, look at all these loads of other different sorts of acts and examine them and do an analysis. This does that, that doesn't do that, kind of trying to start defining the problem or honing into things and start um, going from that intuition, you know, we got a sense about this, but we're going to move into something else to starting to prove stuff and designing and testing out ideas, working with other people, going in workshops a lot and kind of talking through ideas. Who is the actual user? You know, what are their actual problems? You know, and coming up with design principles and design scenarios. And that's what I'm going to talk about um, primarily right here. So for instance, uh, we came up with these uh, guidelines or principles. And these are just, just do this and everything should be fine. So yeah, I'm just going to move that up. OK, yeah, fine. Can I point? Yeah? Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's it. So these are what you should think about. These are principles, right? And then kind of expanding that to kind of where it comes from research, where is the evidence, where are the insights, where do they come from, how can we prove that? You know, um, and then developing patterns, things, these are like the rules, like the ball goes outside, it's out, you know, that sort of thinking, right? But you don't know where the ball is going to go inside the playing field. Um, and then just some illustrations of what that might look like. Like you should probably tell uh, that the battery is going to run out and that sort of things. But it's good to think about the basics because often people forget about the basics. So when you give these guidelines and when people are building things on top of your things, then they have kind of an easier way of it and everybody's making better things in the end of the day. And uh, yeah, and then how you can create scenarios. So again, uh, what are the design considerations? What did we find out in research? We talked to loads of people, loads of different types of people. We had all sorts of demo different demographics and we came to this conclusions. And what might that look like, right? And this is how to illustrate it all. So real quick, what now, right? Um, so you should probably just ask yourself some questions, right? Because you might be building tools, but somebody has to use those in the end of the day. It might be in a CLI, but they still have to go through a process, and that process might suck. And you should find out if it does by talking to them, really. Um, and again, how can I make tools that, other, that make people's other tools work better as well, right? And yeah, the... Yeah, the rough version is, is yeah, you aren't your users. That, that's kind of what it boils down to. And just think about the platforms you're creating because things can happen. Lots of unexpected things, lots of really nice things. And that's it. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, rinse, and repeat. And I'm over time. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Nikos. I'm a developer at WeatherXM. And... Uh, I'm going to tell you a few things about what we do there, some of the challenges we're facing, uh, trying to do all of those things, and how we're solving some of those right now. So what we do at WeatherXM is that uh, we are a depth-in project, and we're trying to solve one of the most challenging problems of today, and that is of interest to almost every one of us. And this is providing accurate weather data and accurate weather forecasting to pretty much everyone. So to do that, we have created our own weather station, which is a station that can be operated by pretty much everyone, is accessible to everyone, and this is what collects the data. And it actually has a secure chip, it has its own private key, so all of the data that are coming out of your station uh, are going to be signed with that private key, so everything is verifiable. You can make sure that uh, the data you see is what the station actually provided, and uh, they have not been tampered with by anyone. So this is uh, the state of the network as it is at the moment. There are a few thousand stations that are active on the network, sending data pretty much uh, uh, every second. And um, yeah, uh, you can find more details about that on the link uh, on, that, on our explorer because this is dynamic. It's constantly changing uh, as weather stations are coming in or uh, if someone uh, create, uh, adds a new station or they take their station offline, this is all going to change. So this is uh, basically how our ecosystem is going to work. So we have the station owners, which are the users that are operating the stations, and they are providing data to the network. And then we have the consumers, which can be enterprises, they can be farmers, and anyone that is basically inter interested in purchasing and using weather data. And those consumers are going to pay uh, to use those data and those money, those, uh, it's going to be tokens in our ecosystem. So this is what is going to be returned back to the users as payment for the data that they provide to the network. And uh, this is a little bit of how our architecture works at the moment. Uh, so our end goal is for all of the data that we collect to be uh, in the end, to find their place on IPFS and to be open to everyone. So at the moment, uh, uh, when, station on, when a station uh, creates a new measurement, uh, those data are being sent uh, to us, WeatherXM. Uh, we do some processing on those data, which is basically normalization, taking out any fault data and some resampling, which is mostly meteorological stuff. And uh, those data are, are then uh, stored on S3, and from there, we are using a tool that has been developed by Tableland, which is called Basin. And it is uh, 
the tool we're currently using to put all of those data on Filecoin and it's also providing us with a way to index those data and guarantees about, uh, about storage. And the next step is data consumers, which uh, we're going to say a little bit about uh, towards the end of the presentation. So uh, the two middle bullets, which is uh, WeatherXM and S3, this is the bit that uh, right now we are trying to make a little bit more decentralized so that it's not relying on any centralized entity for the data to reach IPFS. And uh, this is a little bit about how those data are going to be used once they have been stored on IPFS. Uh, so uh, we're going to be running some computation on those data and we're using Bacalao for that, which is going to perform some algorithms that are basically uh, creating the quality of those data. And this is also what is going to dictate how many rewards each user is getting. So for example, if you deploy your station inside your living room, this is very bad data. So you are probably not going to get any rewards for that. So this is the way uh, that we are going to ensure that only the users that provide uh, good data are going to be rewarded by the network because this, in the end of the day, these are the data that uh, the consumers are interested in. And um, yeah, and we also have a few other um, algorithms like proof of location, which is uh, basically ensuring that uh, the station is where you're saying it's going to be. And uh, yeah, that's all going to be public. It's going to be verifiable by the community. So anyone can go there, see the data for themselves, check the computations that were running on those data and verify that the rewards were giving out and everything is correct and is in fact happening as it should. And uh, yeah, last bit is uh, who is going to be the end consumers of all of that data. And uh, the most obvious uh, consumer for us is weather oracles. So what we're aiming to do is to be able to provide all of those data uh, in the form of an oracle to on-chain smart contracts, and uh, uh, they can be used for any sort of stuff with uh, the most prominent is probably going to be weather insurance, and uh, yeah, and uh, that's the end. Okay, so uh, I was surprised today, so I don't have really slides. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, so I work at number zero on IRO, but I want to talk about basically the components that make IRO. Uh, they're all crates published on crates.io, uh, and usable under a good uh, open source license. So if you need something which is kind of related to what we're doing, but not the whole thing, you can just grab the thing and use it. We are happy if you do that. And what I want to talk about is uh, this crate called Biotree, which is basically uh, the, uh, a different take on verified streaming. Um, it's inspired by the Bio crate uh, from the original Bake 3 author, Jack O'Connor, but it takes a slightly different approach. But first demo, um, so um, I want to show a few things. So I got a, let, so before you, um, before I tell you how to use this thing, uh, you should know why you want to use it. Uh, I got a big collection of data. I grabbed some movies from uh, the Internet Archive and just want to show how fast it is to add this stuff to IRO. So uh, I'm just adding this stuff from scratch. And um, yeah, this was it, six gigabytes in uh, three seconds. And we can get it even a bit faster, but I think it's fast enough. This is rarely the limiting factor. So that's one thing. That's basically just the speed of Lake 3. Um, then the next thing you can do, I think Brenton showed this already, but I want to show it again. Um, you can now run a gateway and um, I have to make sure that it actually runs. Um, oh shit, I changed the branch. Okay, and then what you can do once the gateway is running is you can um, get an index obviously and then you can stream these files. These are some very old movies that are not under copyright. You have to go way long back until you find something which is without copyright. But what the main point is here, you see range requests which get translated to 
uh, Blake three requests for a part of a blob. So we have one giant blob. It doesn't have any internal structure, but nevertheless, you can say I only want offset whatever byte to whatever byte from it, and you don't need to get the whole thing. That's a fundamental difference to IPFS, um, for example, SHA-2 blobs, where you can only get the whole thing. You cannot get a part of a blob. You can get a part of the blob, but not in a verified way. Um, so, okay, so how does this, this fit in to uh, what we're doing? So there is the IRO, is the entire package. And if you just want to do buys, if you just want to do this streaming example, what I had, you can use IRO, obviously, but you can also use the IRO bytes crate. Uh, the IRO bytes crate uh, has some networking requirements, and if you don't want to do those, then you can use BOW tree, which is just the BOW, um, the BOW streaming approach on top of uh, the Blake free hash function. So now I go a little bit more into detail. Um, sorry, it's a bit technical. Um, just a very short explanation how this works. Here it is. So um, this is how a BOW tree looks. Basically, you have chunks. The chunks are one kilobyte, and then you take two chunks and make a node on top of these two chunks, which then consists of two hashes, and then you go on and on until you, are, until you have a single hash, and that's then your root. And the root gets a special flag, um, but that's a long story. Um, so what, um, what Bao does is add the concept of an outboard. What the outboard is, as you can see there uh, below, I think I'm Oh, that's, awesome. that's even better. And now you have basically the tree in a very compact serialized form on disk. And then when you want to do a range request, what you do, imagine you want these two blocks. Uh, what you can then do, obviously, you are not concerned. You don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. So you just uh, basically need a path from the root to uh, the data that you're interested in. And then the data itself, obviously, because you stream the data, not the validation of the data. And that's exactly what the BOW tree crate uh, does for you. Um, so there's a crate called BOW from the original author. So what's the difference between uh, BOW tree and BOW? Uh, one, BOW tree is just the tree. It's basically, it provides just the logic to describe how this tree works. And it has a little bit of I.O., but it's really not the main point. Uh, the second thing is it has async support, so if you need async, um, it's a bit hard if you have a sync Rust crate to, to uh, have async support. And the third, and I guess the most major thing, is we have this thing called chunk groups, which means that you can imagine these blocks are one kilobyte, and these are uh, 32 bytes. So the overhead, all in all, if you add it all up, the overhead of the output is about one sixteenth of the content. And in some cases, that's a bit much. So you end up like, dragging around these giant output files. So what we do is, uh, it's also a concept that Jack O'Connor um, uh, invented, but we implemented it. Um, we just don't store uh, the, uh, the part of the tree below a certain level. So you can f configure, for example, I only want to keep this part of the tree, and I don't want to store this. So the downside is you have to do a little bit more computation, but it's very, very fast, so you will always never be um, negatively impacted by that. Uh, but the plus side is that your output gets much smaller. So we are using a so-called chunk group size of 16. So for every 16 blocks, we store one. Uh, so the lowest four levels we don't store, meaning that our chunk is 16 kilobytes large. And uh, that is kind of a good compromise. And uh, if you use the IRO, um, the BOW tree crate, you can choose this. But inside IRO, we have just fixed it. So we, are not, uh, we don't believe in giving people lots and lots of config options. We believe in, we choose a good option and you don't have to bother. We have figured out the right option, kind of. So inside IRO, it is, um, what's going on? Anyway, uh, it is fixed, but inside BOW3, depending on what you want to do, it is, uh, it is open. Um, so you can configure it between zero and whatever some value. Um, so just out of interest, who in the audience is uh, familiar with Rust or is it mostly a, uh, one, two? 
Yeah, okay, so a few people, not, not that few. Um, so for, for Iro itself, we also have bindings, but for these crates, you would have to do the bindings yourself if you're not using Rust, but um, I guess if you have a higher level problem, you can just use Iro directly. But if you're a Rust developer and you have some hashing problem to be solved, um, then you should, really should consider this. And one final thing is, uh, one, one final thought, uh, this, so Blake 3 is the first major new hash function after SHA-2, and it adds a major new capability, meaning this addressing data inside a blob. And I really think that IPFS itself should find a way to support this, because it's such a major improvement over, over the status quo, and um, if IPFS would support this, then we would have a much easier way to interface with IPFS. So our way to do blobs is just one big blob with internal structure. And if, you, if IPFS would find, find a way to support this, then we could just build a bridge that the bridge that Brandon so, uh, showed and directly bridge it one to one. But currently we can't do that because IPFS knows hashes and it has the ability to abstract over different hash functions, but it does not have the ability to use the special features of one particular hash function like Blake 3. So we, we, we are a little bit unhappy that we have to diverge a little bit there, but I, I feel that we don't have a choice. So it would be really great if IPFS would uh, evolve in that case to allow um, supporting hashes that have these special features of uh, seeking inside a, a single blob. And that's my final word. So you mentioned how you can stream uh, data from a bow tree. Is there a way to stream data to a bow tree? Uh, yes, yeah, so currently there is not. So currently you have to have the data and then you compute the output and then you compute the hash. But in this bow tree crate, I'm working on something where you can um, do an append-only abstraction, basically. So you can, let's say you have a bunch of data, you compute a hash, and then you have a bunch of additional data and you don't want to recompute the entire thing. So you just add a little bit of data, do a little bit of hashing, but only for the, for the part that is new, and then you get the new hash. Mm -hmm. And it will be the same hash as if you would have hashed the entire thing. So that, that is included, but we don't know how to expose it on the IRO level. That's, by the way, that's another reason to, to look at uh, about tree if you're a very advanced user, because in IRO we don't have that yet, because I don't know how to expose it in a good user-friendly way. But in about tree it already exists. Okay, let's, let's talk later. <laughs> Hello, uh, my, my name is Alvaro. I work as a research engineer at Status. Uh, you may know this company. It's been for a while in this ecosystem. Uh, we are building a bunch of stuff, decentralized storage, decentralized messaging, we have the Logos Collective. We also have an Ethereum client called Nimbus. But today I came to talk about the Waku protocol, which we believe is going to be the communication layer of uh, Web3. So let's start with the problem statement. Uh, we have Alice that wants to send a message to Bob, Charlie, and Dario, right? So this is solved with a server. Alice sends this message to the server, and then the server replicates it and sends it to Bob, Charlie, and yeah, and that's it, right? But as you imagine, we don't want a server in the middle, right? So there is another approach, which uh, Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dario, they can, connect, uh, they can connect to each other directly, right? So they can send the message to each other without any central party routing the messages. So Alice can, can send the message to Bob, then Alice to Charlie, and then maybe Alice can send the message to Dario, but since Charlie already has it, Charlie can send the message to Dario. So Alice will save some uh, bandwidth, some upstream bandwidth. So this is kind of solved by Gossip Sub, built by Leap Peer to Peer, and is one of the core protocols that Waku uses. But there are some problems that haven't been addressed, which are the following five problems. So we have uh, the latency, um, the message propagation time uh, depends on many factors that I will explain later on. Uh, you are also exposed to denial of, of service attacks. Um, also, what happens if your node is offline and then you are online again? You are missing the messages from the past, right? 
Uh, also, uh, since we want to scale to many people, uh, we want people to, uh, that runs in mobile, desktop, data centers to be able to run this protocol. So um, Gossip's app is not really made for resource restricted devices, especially in terms of bandwidth. And then scalability. We want to reach millions, if not billions of people, right? So uh, I will go uh, deep into the five problems. Uh, first of all, latencies. So as you can see here, we have Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dario again. So if Alice sends a Bob to Dario and it passes through Bob and Charlie, right? This message has three hops, right? So each of these hops adds a small latency to the message propagation, right? Um, the latency that Bob will see is going to be lower because Bob is closer to Alice, right? Um, yes, so the latency, uh, if any of you know Gossip Tab uh, by Leap Peer to Peer, uh, the latency can be improved by this so called D parameter. And, uh, but the latency also depends on the amount of nodes in the network. The more nodes in the network, the more latency that you will have. So here we have the trade offs that we have. More nodes, more latency, which is bad. Uh, more D or higher the D, lower the latency, which is good. But higher D means also higher bandwidth. This will mean that your node will consume tons of bandwidth, right? And then the last trade off is the more message size, more latency. Because if the message is very big, then the time that it takes to transmit, to be transmitted, then it's gonna be higher, of course, right? So yeah, we are also exposed to denial of service attack because what happens if Alice starts sending messages to everyone, right? So uh, this is fixed uh, in the centralized, uh, in a centralized environment in Web Web two, but uh, doing this in a decentralized way, it's a bit more more complex. Well, you get the idea with all the messages. Uh, yeah, what happens if uh, your node goes offline and there? and then you are online again, uh, then you have to fetch the messages from the past and you need someone to provide you these messages, right? Um, by now we use a simple database, but we are exploring other alternatives, like for example, IPFS. And yeah, as I said before, uh, we want people on mobile, desktop, laptop, whatever, to run uh, this protocol. And yeah, last issue, scalability, the network should scale, right? So uh, yeah, we want to scale to many, many, many people. Um, so what's Waku? Okay, Waku is the protocol uh, that is being built by Status, and it's being used by different companies right now. Uh, we have an open testnet that you can join, and aims to solve all these five problems. But how? So uh, first of all, we have latency, right? We solve it limit limiting the message size. Uh, we also have found a trade-off that we believe is the best one between D and the bandwidth. Uh, denial of service, we are using a rate limiting, a decentralized rate limiting protocol, which is called RLN, stands for rate limiting nullifiers, is based on zero knowledge proofs. And we also have some peer scoring that will kick uh, a bad peer. For offline nodes, we have uh, the store protocol. So if you are offline for some time and then you're up again, you can use this store node to send you the, the messages that you missed. For resource restricted devices, we have light clients. And for scalability, we are sharding the network in multiple shards. Um, I would like to share with you some uh, research highlights from the last uh, months, weeks, which are the propagation times that we have right now in Waku, uh, simulated in a real environment, and also the overhead of uh, RLN. If you remember from the previous slide, I said, I said it's based on zero knowledge proofs, so the generation and verification of these proofs uh, will add an overhead in the pipeline of latencies. So regarding the propagation times, um, long story short, it's impossible to give a single number on the propagation time because each node and each message will see a different latency. So uh, with these numbers, 1,000 nodes, D equals to six. If you, if you remember the gossip sub parameter, and the message size of 100 kilobytes, we have a latency of 800 milliseconds, average latency. And uh, these are real simulations with Shadow, a tool for simulation for network simulations. Maybe you know TestGround, Kurtosis, or these other tools. Uh, these simulations use RLN. Uh, they also simulate a latency of 100 milliseconds between each node. 
and the bandwidth it's also limited on uh, 80 and 40 megabits per second up and down so as you can see the, the simulations are quite ac accurate and yeah the last highlight uh, TLDR um, the proof the zero knowledge proof that we have for RLN uh, the proof generation time is constant no matter the size of the message 0.15 seconds which is kind of okay uh, this adds to the whole pipeline of latencies and then on the right side we have uh, that uh, yeah the proof verification time it's also constant 0.012 seconds which is quite low and um, yeah this is added by each node so if the message travels five hops then you are going to add this latency to to each hop and um, yeah this is my last slide uh, we have an uh, open testnet that you can join at any time uh, it's based on Ethereum Sepolia, which is a, a testnet, an Ethereum testnet. We use this for the decentralized write limiting. So if you scan this, you can join. We haven't announced this publicly yet, so this is a bit of an alpha leak. And we are hiring, uh, not only in Waku, but in the whole status uh, company. So if you want to join the team, feel free to talk with me after this talk or scan this QR code. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great to see uh, numbers powering the protocol design. Uh, can you tell a little more about this shadow network simulator? Um, so I'm asking with the background of, uh, could this also be used to simulate things like gossip sub or anything? Or just tell uh, give some words about uh, uh, the shadow thing. Yeah, definitely. So actually I have some friends uh, working in the NIM Leap Peer to Peer implementation that have used Shadow uh, in, in Leap Peer to Peer and Gossip Sub, so you can do it. Uh, but the, um, the worst part of Shadow is that it, does, it doesn't measure CPU time. So uh, all these latencies that we are, I mean, we are adding like a fake await with the times that we know that RLN adds, right? But if you have some very crazy cryptographic thingy that takes a lot of time to execute, Shadow doesn't really take that into account. So it's more focused on the networking layer. As you can see, you can simulate latencies, you can simulate uh, constraints on the bandwidth, you can even simulate uh, package drops and so on. But answering to your question, uh, I have friends in Status using this uh, with Gossip Sub, and I can put you in contact. And it's also open source. It's open source, okay, fully cool. open source. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you. I, I'm built in Rust. I think someone before uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> mentioned Rust. Uh, my name is Doruk. I'm a 19 years old university student. We have a startup called Dorkodo. Oops. Uh, it's crashed. I will try again. Um, sorry. So I will summarize what we are doing here. We are working on a okay. We are working on a social and decentralized knowledge protocol uh, called Wonder. This is our logo. Um, so let me start with our problem set that I believe you are already familiar with. We we want a real world P two P internet of users, not developers. Also, we want a self-sovereign user agency, and by user agency we mean identity, data, and social circle. These are should be owned and controlled by users, not public, um, not, not centralized companies or services. We want interoperable apps and services. We want reusable, composable, and self-certifying semantic data and pick up what Web 3.0 movement uh, kind of failed to go into the mainstream with their semantic data thing. We're trying to do this with the help of other protocols and technologies that overall developed in the industry in the recent years. Also, we want local first, offline friendly, and censorship resistant value and data publishing and no more walled gardens. This was our goal. We first started as two kids in our rooms, trying to build some you know, real world apps. We had some ideas for them. But we wanted to do this in a decentralized and user-owned way. We didn't just want to be, become one of those Web2 companies. So instead, we started to working on the technology to enable that. 
there was already some building blocks ready to go, but there was this, a missing point that we believe for any, it's really hard for a, a traditional developer, a conventional de developer to pick up Web3 tools and build a product with them. So what are we doing? This is Wonder, uh, in simple words, user agency. How, how can we enable that? First, we have documents and events. Documents are how we store data. They're like IPFS blocks. Um, we have metadata, public, and data, and event in a document. And these documents are just like regular objects that you store in your uh, application. And we have events. Uh, events have IDs, kinds, you know, just like Noster. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with that protocol. There are, um, our, one of our principles was that we didn't want to reinvent everything from scratch. We wanted to build on top of the existing building blocks that are already adopted and make them mainstream or easy to use uh, with our SDK. We are a protocol first. We are building, we are trying to build a protocol first a SDK with that. So what is our network structure? Here is this. You're an average user. You use probably many apps now on your phone. And I just sketched these over the back. Um, sorry, I didn't have a pitch deck or a beautiful looking slides, but uh, I hope it's clear enough. You are a user, you have a private key, that's all good. We are all very familiar with that. But that's not a real world user now is uh, very accustomed to. You know, people want freedom, but they just don't care or understand enough of the technology. So we are just trying to make it this also easy for users. Our, we, are, we are trying to make this easy for both developers and users in the aspect of experience. So you have many apps, X, A, B, I mean, there can be an infinite number of, of apps, but they're just user interfaces. Under the hood, they use an, a client, and that client is, uh, the, is our SDK, and it sets up a peer. A peer is both, it, it both supports P2P and you know, the, the classic server client architecture. We store personal data on pods, on things called pods. These are like your accounts. All your data, your de decentralized identity, it's all stored safely in your pod. And that pod is much like a GitHub repo. It's st also, uh, this is the local part. We have clients and peers. They're just like a s the same thing, but clients are much more uh, powerful abstractions, you know, tools that everyone can use, just like a file browser or a web browser. But applications, you know, they provide a beautiful user interfaces and experiences for those actions, your regular actions. We have something called seeds, and, they are, and their main purpose, they're just ordinary peers, but their role in this network is uh, provide data and value to the rest of the network. There may be different seed implementations. Anyone can run a seed on their computer, or services and companies can do that. And your pod is remotely synced to one of those seeds that you, as a user or as a developer, add the seed's address to your app or to your code. You add a seed and your pod, your all data securely synced to a seed on the global network, and these seeds, by default, are compatible with Noster, IPFS, and the World Wide Web. Also, we want to add more protocols and standards and other networks, other ecosystems, uh, to make this possible so that we are not locking you in. Any seed will be, by default, a Nostra relay or an IPFS node by default. That's, this is what we are trying to do. 
uh, this is the overall architecture. A little detail about pods. For public data, we distribute events as event feeds to seeds, NOSTA relays, IPFS network, and as RSS to the World Wide Web. For private and personal data, we also, we already stored this on a pod, but we, for secret, secret data, we keep it encrypted, local first and P2P synced, but open data is public, uh, is stored in the public index of the pod. So we are building this open source. We are just in the discovery experimental stage now. The code is all on the open source on GitHub. You can, if you're interested in the idea or if you believe we have some mistakes, or if you have some recommendations for us, you can reach out to me at dork at dorkodo.com, or you can visit our website, or our GitHub organization page, or hit me up on Twitter, X. Uh, thank you. One of the problems with applications in the wild is uh, like you have a schema for your application, and it ends up evolving, and that is yes. a very gnarly problem. So do you have any plans about uh -huh. how yeah. schema migration? We're already supporting on? IPLD and multi-formats for that. Also, we, uh, as I said, we have a metadata on documents. And in these metadata are just like HTML pages. Uh, they're open, and you can have uh, you can have a link to your data schema, and the application, the code can, or any external app, a third-party service code can access can have access to that schema and uh, fetch it, you know, for type completion, etc. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dennis. I'm part of ProBlab. ProBlab is doing network measurements and uh, protocol optimizations for the um, IPFS network specifically. Um, and we are part of Protocol Labs at the moment. Um, just two words or three about ProBlab itself. So um, we are doing network measurements and protocol optimizations, especially, uh, as I said, in the IPFS network, but also the Falcon, for example, and mainly the P2P-based networks. And uh, the picture on the right depicts what we actually um, think how things work. So you might think, uh, things might work, but probably or sometimes not as you would expect them to work. And so I think this picture just depicts this really well. And uh, in this talk, I wanted to go about, uh, talk about, so what has happened in the past year, so in measuring the IPFS network and what the ProBlab specifically has done in the past year. And I want to highlight four different projects here. And afterwards, I will show some uh, just long-term trends of what has happened in the IPFS network or IPFS DHT over uh, the past few months. So a, a project that ProBlab has done or something that we have uncovered in the beginning of the year is a major um, DHT network incident. Um, so there's also a blog post about it. We found out through network measurements that um, around 60% of the network or 60% of the nodes participating in the DHT were unreachable. and for, for better or for worse, no one noticed, um, which is a good argument for decentralization because um, I think in any other centralized infrastructure, if 60% of the infrastructure goes down, you would definitely notice. And the only thing what we found out um, is that there was a latency spike. So DHT lookups were a little slower, DHT puts were a bit slower and so on. We identified this um, configuration er error and encouraged the community to upgrade their Kubo instances and nodes in general. And we saw afterwards, that the latency went down to a steady state uh, um, then again, starting in February or so on. And in another thing that we did around the same time is we measured the performance impact of the Hydra boosters. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Hydra boosters, but they, the idea of Hydra boosters is we place a lot of um, Kubo or like DHT servers into the DHT key space to um, receive all the provider records in the network so that we can serve um, them back to the network at any point in the key space and thus accelerate the lookup performance uh, and, um, and publication performance as well. And we found out that the latency gain that we get by operating these Hydra boosters is actually in the order of perhaps 10% or so. And this didn't warrant the um, the costs that they uh, incurred on Protocol Labs' uh, bill. So it was around 1.2 million per year. And so we decided to shut them shut, shut them down. And we sh uh, we could shut them down without worrying that the network will fall apart or that we would um, yeah gain another um, t I don't know 
one second or so latency in DHT lookups. So this is yeah another project that we did. Then another part on the latency gain side is, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but if you put something into the DHT, at least two years ago, and even one year ago, putting something in the DHT took around, let's say, 30 seconds, sometimes a minute, sometimes even two minutes or, um, to, to write something into the DHT. And this, so in the last year, when the network um, got a little more mature by having more stable nodes, this naturally went down to around six to seven seconds. But we at ProBlab uh, designed a new algorithm, which we call Pro Optimistic Provide, um, which is doing a few things differently. And without sacrificing availability of, of um, records in the DHT, we actually brought it down to less than a second. And so in this, in this case, it shows a second values, but this is only because we are showing like the 95th percentile in this case. But the average case is uh, way, uh, uh, way less than a second. Um, and then on the bottom right hand side, we have um, LipidP improvements. So we ran a large scale measurement campaign on uh, hole punching. So how does nut traversal work with LipidP? And uh, yeah, we figured out a few different things that could be improved in the protocol, which then, f which then could flow back in, in, DCD, uh, in, in a version two of this uh, hole punching protocol. So these are just four things that we've worked on over the past year. And um, yeah, I brought a couple of slides which just look back over the year. So how, how does the network um, has, how, how, do, how has it evolved over the past few months? And so what we can see here is the date on the x-axis and um, the number of unique peer IDs that, the, that we find in the public IPFS DHT, um, which is now called the Amino DHT, so just so you know. Um, the blue line is the total number of unique peers and the green, uh, green line shows the number of peers that are actually online. And the black line at the bottom shows the ones that uh, we consider offline. And then there are some spikes um, that you can also see, and these are just measurement artifacts. And what we can see is that in the beginning of the year, we had like a slow increase in, in peers uh, that, or nodes joining the, the network. Then we had a plateau. And then during May this year, there were some two steps where we gained around, what is it, 10,000 new peers within a few weeks. Then we had a long, steady state again, and in the middle of last month, uh, we had the sharp decline, and uh, a lot of nodes, around 7,000 nodes, left the network. And let me skip this slide for a second. And if we look at the agent distribution, so if we want to know which nodes have actually joined the network and which nodes have left the network, we can see here that in the middle of October, we see this huge drop in agents uh, of the Kubo 0.18 version, which shows us, okay, mainly Kubo 0.18 nodes have uh, left the network. And this in general shows us just the number of uh, unique agent version, or like the, the number of agents in, in the network. So the graph that we've shown previously, but just um, classic, um, split by the number, uh, by, by their agent uh, themselves. And um, so the, this, shows the same data, but just um, split, or like this shows the share of which agent versions are actually deployed in the network over the past year. It's a bit dif uh, difficult to see, it's, it, a lot of stuff is going on. But we, here we can see at the bottom left, these are the Hydra boosters. Um, at the bot uh, top left you can see that the Hydra boosters are the solid blue color, and we can see that they were running uh, at around 2,000 nodes um, at the beginning of the year, and then we decided to shut them down, and so in the beginning of April, we slowly phase them out here. So this is um, this is part of why uh, what ProBlab has um, uh, yeah ProBlab has suggested to do. And then um, across the whole year, you can see that this dotted orange uh, area here is the 0 0.18 Kubo version, which is by far the most popular to date, still and throughout the whole year as well. But then here at the end, we can also see that um, we have like this this. Uh, gray version, gray version coming up, which is um, Kubo 0.22, and some other new Kubo versions as well uh, at the end here. And if we look at these newer versions, um, we can see um, that this is like the community uptake. So this just shows the Kubo version 0.19 to 24, and again the date in 2023 and uh, the number of peers that actually run these Kubo versions. And we can see at each time when when the new Kubo version was released, there was a steep uptake. And um, what, what we also can see here is this, this wiggled line, which is like a daily periodicity. So this shows us that these new Kubo versions are mainly adopted by 
I would argue residential, not, not mainly, but uh, also uh, updated by residential. Uh, Kubo uh, nodes, which have like this daily periodicity, so they shut them down at night and turn them on, on in the morning again. Um, because if you look back at this graph, um, even though you have this little wiggled line here, it's pretty stable. So most of these uh, nodes in the network are actually run by pretty stable uh, node providers, I would argue. And yeah, then, then we can also see that every time a new node version, a new Kubo version is released, the previous version goes down, which is also expected. Um, but what we, what, what actually would be better is that not the previous version, which is um, a newer Kubo version, goes down, but also that one of these, like quite old version, like not they are not particularly old, but for example, this it would be great if this. Kubo 0.18 version would go down significantly if a new Kubo.024 version was released, for example. So these are just a few insights or a few things that we can see from, from this data. And um, yeah, these are just uh, a, a few graphs here. I think I'm running out of time. We also measure the retrieval latency over um, continuously over the year. And um, just to give, give you a ballpark of, of how the retrieval latency looks like, um, the P90 retrieval latency of looking at provider records on the DHT is around 400 milliseconds from, from the EU. The same stuff we also measure for the interplanetary network indexers. And here we can see um, that in the uncached version, a lookup in the network index is roughly twice as fast. And in the cached version, it's more than an order of magnitude faster to look things up uh, in the network indexer, but you sacrifice the decentralized nature of things. Then again, um, the publication latency is at, at, in the order of 15 to 20 seconds in the, again, P90 case from, from the EU. And this optimistic provide algorithm that we've designed at Probe Lab actually can bring this down to only a few uh, hundred milliseconds. And then there's a, a third algorithm which trades off um, like a, a kind of excessive resource consumption by crawling the network and uh, having a full routing table, so this is this full RT uh, here. Uh, we can, th this is even faster, but at the trade of um, yeah, having like excessive resource consumption. So um, depending on your use case, you would rather use one or the other. Um, yeah, and this optimistic provider is right now, it's still an experimental flag in, in Kubo, um, but I think it works wo really well. And uh, as you can see, the speed up is significant here. Right, yeah, and to close, uh, so the Probe Lab roadmap um, consists of looking at IPNS. So from the community, we sense that IPNS is still something um, that is very much uh, a pain point because it's not fast enough or um, you cannot look up the, the records very well. And I think the stuff that we've developed for this um, optimistic provide that I just showed you can also apply to IPNS and we can um, have uh, good latency improvements there. Then the second one would be Gossip Sub that ProBlab wants to look into um, in the context of Filecoin and Ethereum, um, the like. And the last bit is lib P2P um, bandwidth requirements because in, during our Hydra Booster study, we found that when you do a lookup at the Hydra Boosters, the, the amount of data that you transmit, 95% um, of that data is just, just the handshake and exchanging metadata. And the actual payload uh, only is around 5% of the data that gets transmitted. So I think there's also something that we could improve here. Yeah, and we are fundraising. So um, if you want to become a backer of this roadmap and your company or um, your project would benefit from insights into this and into improvements of this, um, become, a, uh, become, become a partner. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. So uh, you mentioned the hole punching uh, statistics. I would be interested in what is the hole punching success rate and is it different for TCP and UDP? So yeah, this is something that, um, so, so the tribal knowledge is that uh, UDP hole punching seems to, uh, is supposed to be easier than TCP. This is something that we didn't find in our measurement study. Um, so UDP and TCP success rates are um, roughly the same. So I would argue UDP is still a bit better, but probably part of, the, like, you could easily explain this with the noise of the measurement. Um, then the overall success rate was around 70%. And this is across all kinds of different routers. So if you, but if you have a router that is, so that you can hole punch, the success rate is much higher. But 
So this 70% um, applies to like the, the population of all routers that part participated in, in this measurement study. And what we also found is, um, so in this DCUTR protocol, so this is the hole punching protocol, you actually do two retries. So you, you try it once, you try it twice, and the third time as well. But what we found is if it doesn't work the first time, with 99% or 97% uh, probability, it won't work the second and third time as well. So this is one thing that would flow back into the protocol design again, um, do a different approach in hole punching. There are different approaches. And so with the second to try, do something else and just, just not do it again. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yitao Shen. I come from China. Can I ask a question about, uh, have you been to China before? No. Is there anybody? Have been to China? Did you heard of Jiaozi? What is Jiaozi? Is it? Yeah, dumplings. Uh, any other more? Yeah, yeah. Jiaozi is uh, basically is a uh, pronounce as uh, same as another meaning in China. It is uh, the first meaning is is dumpling. Yes. Another meaning is. Uh, the world's first the early earliest uh, paper money in the world. The first paper money in the in the world. Okay. Today I want to introduce Jiaozi FS, uh, another implementation of IPFS. Uh, basically, it's uh, focused on the version control features or uh, has a data versioning primitives inside to build a data versioning fair system for many, many use cases, for example, machine learning pipelines, AI pipelines, and the configuration management, blah, 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 use cases. Okay, let us look back to the Kota Corporation. I think everybody here knows the Git, yes? And the GitHub. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you can see the parts, the, you know, after computer uh, born, you can see lots of different generation of Kota Corporation. The current, the most famous one is Git. Git is good at Kota Corporation and uh, programming, and especially for the uh, uh, code world, you know, it's very, very famous. But, uh, but for Data Corporation, uh, data first, for, firstly, data is any collection of bits of value. But for the past many years, uh, maybe 10 years, as far as I know, in China, lots of big gains of internet components, they have, they have a very, very huge uh, data size and a, a huge distributed storage like Alibaba Cloud. And lots of uh, internet components, they have their own uh, data centers with distributed st storage, distributed file systems, like a Google file system, uh, many different implementations of uh, Google file systems. But the data corporation till now is still copy and paste. If you want to make a corporation with uh, the some data size, you need to copy and paste the, the data size. As you can see here, the Hadoop uh, ETFS and uh, Amazon S3, but how do how can we make a data corporation better? That is why we want to build JAWSFS. And the data is not a, uh, some most of the time data is not standalone, just code or just the data, uh, because code is uh, code and is on another kind of data. For example, data uh, models of machine learning and AI. Sometimes code is with data, sometimes data is with code. So in modern time, and for the modern data analysis, we need to think of how to make a cooperation with the data. How solutions work for code and the data today? Yes, there is a, a already exists this, this is some some uh, uh, data corporation solutions, for example, the Git large file system. It is uh, it is good fit for Git. It's uh, integrating very well with the Git, uh, you know, GitHub and the Git. But it's not enough because uh, we want to build over IPFS open standards 
for example, CADs and uh, and lots of specification for some routings and the cooperation with other nodes. So, uh, in JavaScript, you can see this uh, structure of uh, um, different layers of the implementation. We can uh, at the bottom layer we have the Git server, Git like server ma data management for the data size. For example, you you can think of that. Uh, uh, push, pull, commit, and the branch, for example. But we don't want to fully support uh, all the command uh, size of Git. Think of that Git is for, for code, it's not for data size. Especially for the machine learning data size and the uh, AI, mod AI modeling is very, very big, very, very huge data size. It's not feasible to set up your own stage staging repository. So not everything is uh, is good uh, like uh, git uh, you know command uh, size, but we will borrow the most of the ideas of the git server, and we have implemented polytree indexing for the content addressable data size management or storage. Maybe you have heard of polytree in other sessions. We have our own polytree library implementation, you can uh, get it from our GitHub. And it is uh, indexing over the content addressable data size to, to make a deduplication of the data size. Think of the different version of the data. Most of the data is the same, but you have a different dirt of the modification or different version of the data. That is the difference is just the dirt. So we need to save the space of the storage. So we need we want to use the content addressable uh, block management and with a high efficiency indexing over these data size, uh, data blocks. And uh, over this storage layer, we have a uh, command line and the SU and the SDK and the UI for different use cases or applications to use the JavaScript. Uh, we can extend it to. Uh, we need to integrate the many SDKs to integrate with the Web2 uh, computation frameworks. I call that is extension. Based on that, we can build a Web3 hugging face. We call that the GitHub. Think of that GitHub is a, is a GitHub. The compared to the GitHub. Okay. This uh, is a picture uh, of architecture of JAWS-FS. Uh, basically, here, here is the JAWS-FS server, and we have the metadata and the data, and we can also integrate the other, um, other data size or on-premise data size to be management by the, by the server. And we can have the SDK and the client to integrate the other computing frameworks. Okay, the use case, first is we can build a Web3 hugging face. And we can build the data versioning for the modern data teams and the, and the platforms. And we can build the data versioning for end to end machine learning pipelines. And because we, ha we are follow the principle and the standard specification of IPFS, we can build a different version of the data NFTs for the models and the output of machine learning. Uh, so you can you can monetize your your output. So that is we call that digital versioning for Web three data economy. How to monetize? We have two directions. The first direction is for enterprise. It's a production machine learning pipelines. The second is is Web three data hub. That's all my, my share. Thank you very much. Please feedback to me. Thank you very much. Uh, so you said you make use of uh, deduplication of one megabyte blocks. I might find it a bit hard to imagine that uh, you know machine learning models, which are basically just random weights, even if you you know do a new training round or something, that they are in any way that the data you know, that one megabyte chunk of that will ever have another megabyte chunk that is identical. So do you actually have any, you know, storage saving from this deduplication or not? 
Uh, as far as, uh, no, you know, as we know, uh, IPFS is famous for deep education uh, solutions for, for the industry. Uh, yes, I found that, uh, is, you know, that is not enough, you know. Yes, as you said, that is a difficult part. We, um, we, had, uh, we have put a lot of effort on this part to manage, to manage huge, uh, you know, megabytes of data size. But the details is, I think, is a little long. So can we think offline? Can we talk this offline? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Secret Finance founder, Masa. Uh, my company is uh, in Switzerland, but I'm from Japan. And Secure Finance is a DeFi project and everything on chain and fully decentralized. And it's very important uh, financial infrastructure to make uh, uh, time value of money into crypto. At this moment, crypto uh, doesn't have this uh, time value of money concept. And we are building yield curve and then achieve a fixed rate interest rates market. Everything on chain and actually our web application is using IPFS and deployed through Flake. And I really love IPFS. So I'm not only a um, finance um, guy, but also I'm a computer science. And I really like IPFS. And I have some contribution to the IPFS community. And that's why I'm here today. So um, actually, I made it to two announcements. So one of these announcements is I actually have been working on translating the Chinese version of IPFS textbook. Um, published three years ago, and it took me three years translating Chinese into native Japanese. I don't speak Chinese, that, that's why it's so difficult. But this is very important to foster uh, Japanese uh, uh, developer uh, community. So it's actually just published um, this week, or last week. And um, so I'm so happy to share this uh, kind of a contribution. And then, you know, <laughs> long-term commitment. And then it finally came out, uh, it's, it's sold in Japan, it's all over uh, Japan, also Amazon.cojp. And what's most uh, like exciting to me is, as you can see here, um, it is you know, located next to the esteemed uh, Mastering TCP IP textbook. So you know, the IPFS is now considered to be, it's kind of a very important protocol. So yeah, that's, uh, I'm so excited to see. And uh, recently I find out, uh, well, this is a photo, but uh, in, in a tweet of, you know, this is like this, you know, if you go to Japan's work, like a bookstore, it's features like this. So it's very, very exciting to see it's really happening here. And uh, this Shosen Book Tower is uh, in Akihabara, there's a really big bookstore. And actually, this IPFS book is bestseller in the, within the computer uh, books. So I'm so excited to share this uh, fact. It's, yeah, it's bestseller in, <laughs> in Japan. So yeah, I'm very excited. So I just want to share, you know, I added a little bit of the, you know, a flavor, um, like, a, like a more, you know, graphic thing, like Academia DHT like a graphic, or oh, let me share the actual thing on the book. Um, yeah, it's basically a more like expansion of IPFS white paper and IPFS uh, and Filecoin white paper. And um, yeah, I can add a lot of uh, like a graphic aspects and uh, yeah, something like this. And uh, also I created some, uh, let's see, it's everything on, IPFS. Let's see. I think it should be here. Let me take what was in. Um, okay, I'll go next, but uh, why it doesn't. Ready? Okay. And another one is actually, yeah, I hosted the, uh, you know, how IPFS works, like I uh, workshops, and then Stephen, you know, show up and then talked about how IPFS works. And the fact is, you know, this video is two gigabytes and it's work perfectly and it's, I can play here. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, it works for even two gigabytes of the size. So it's super amazing to see it. So yeah, that is a fact. And um, oh, can play the video? Yeah, so yeah, this is my contribution to the IPFS community. And uh, as a DeFi founder, I just want to make a, a big announcement that we're going to main it live. 
December 15th, just one month away. Uh, starting with Global Itayose for book building. And uh, two weeks later, we open up the global bond market for crypto, which doesn't exist uh, at this moment. So we are so happy to uh, share it on the, the bond market with you, um, run by uh, IPFS uh, front end. So please join on uh, December 15th. And uh, if I have two minutes, I'd like to basically play uh, kind of like an introduction to secure finance, if I allow. Okay. Yeah. In a pretty deep way, Web3 and crypto represent this amazing opportunity to rewrite the rules and how economies and governments work. And so it's a combination of computing and the power of the computing platform. But the finance market is larger, much larger. And clearly we are missing our capital markets. And as a secure finance, we want to extend this maturity to longer, let's say five years. I realized change needs to happen when I saw a LIBOR scandal where a group of bankers been manipulated benchmark interest rates that's governing a trillion dollar scale of market. That's the reason why I decided not to go back to traditional finance. What's missing in the DeFi space is uh, clearly the yield curve, which is considered to be a continuous plot of interest rates over uh, time axis. We can build yield curve for any currencies as long as we have strong uh, economic demand. What first impressed me about secured finance, I think, is the team's level of professionality, level of knowledge. I worked at Goldman Sachs for 11 years. GSR is a trader, investor, market maker, and ecosystem partner. I think the future is very bright for institutional entry into crypto. The user won't be just merely seeing one number or getting the feedback in terms of what their yield would be given different risk factors and be able to produce a lot more diagnostics on the success of their lending profile. Secure finance is for many different users from retail to institutional. By combining blockchain technology and the traditional finance, we can actually create a better platform and a better world. The future of finance is here. Right. Thank you very much.